Let's look now at, the, some, uh, at some specifics of what happened in Parliament. You'd recall that the Chief Justice herself led the five-member panel and some key issues came up. Eric Maranagbeta is with me in studio to walk us through the key findings or the key um, outlines that the Chief Justice, who led the five-member judge panel, put out. So, yes, Anna, thank you for joining us As again. It's always a pleasure, Martin. Let's dive straight into it. And so, I mean, you've provided quite succinct uh, grounds upon which we're here, how we've arrived here, and the subsequent development and the questions that need to be asked as to what, what happens next in relation to Parliament. And we, we got an indication of when possibly the House could be recalled. But back to the basics as to the questions that, the, the, that had been asked of the Supreme Court, matters on jurisdiction and the likes as to whether or not it was an appropriate forum for Alexander Penyomarkin to have proceeded to and not start from the High Court. Uh, the, her ladyship, Gertrude Tokonu, who chaired the panel yesterday in delivering the judgment, had this to say, that if anyone finds that a meaning is being given to any provision of the 1992 Constitution that the person disputes, then Article 2 and Article 130-1A mandates that only the Supreme Court has jurisdiction to provide the people of Ghana with a correct interpretation of the provision of the Constitution. Now, she goes on, uh, and so this had to do with the question of jurisdiction, amongst many other things, and whether or not uh, the court's jurisdiction had been properly invoked in seeking interpretation and amongst many things, seeking the reliefs which were granted mm. in that initial stay order which Alexander Penyomarkin sought from the Supreme Court. And so mm. this was the court's position on that matter. Now, let's move on to uh, the big question which was on the matter of the service because the speaker, uh, through his affidavit, uh, made it quite clear. And that became a subject of contention when the Attorney General raised those concerns that those... Uh, pieces of details as captured in the affidavit, uh, he described as disparaging of, oh. of the courts because the speaker made the case that the chief justice was aware of constitutional breaches in serving parliament and yet proceeded to, to grant that stay. So here's what she says, that every procedure used by the Supreme Court to serve the processes on the speaker of parliament were actually in conformity with law and the circulars as issued by the Chief Justice, there's still a lot of debate mm. uh, in relation to this particular matter yeah. that has to do with the service. Despite the, the CJ returning with, with the verdict that there was no constitutional breach, there is still mm. uh, debate outside of it that that might not be entirely accurate, particularly in relation to the bit about the circulars, mm. which uh, was some form of agreement between the, the CJ and then the Speaker of Parliament in relation to how yep. members of Parliament will be served and then uh, the, the, the Speaker himself can be served. And so that's, that's, that's one so, on so that. So, I mean, for, for the lay person, what this simply means is that, so for those who may not know, it's not just any day that you can get up and go and serve Parliament. Absolutely. And you can even not serve Parliament on Mondays because Parliament does not sit on Mondays. Absolutely. Unless in extreme cases. So if you have a writ from whichever court, and you go to parliament on a Monday and you serve it, you have misserved. I don't know if that's the right legal parlance for it. <laughs> but then, it. between Tuesday and Thursday, when parliament sits. usually sits, you can actually serve parliament through the legal team or the lawyers of parliament. A legal department. But if you want to serve the speaker, the provision, there are clear provisions of when you can serve the speaker. So the other contention that the lawyers of Speaker Bargain raised in court, which you alluded to, mm. was that they think even the process of serving the speaker, when Apenio Marking had a banter with the speaker, the speaker said that the service was even thrown to the clerk's desk. And that act of throwing a court writ on the, throwing it, you have done something wrong, yeah. legally wrong. And it's supposed to go to the legal department exactly. and not necessarily the so clerk's. So she just wanted to bring clarity to when and how you can serve the house. And she says they have absolutely done no wrong. There was, yeah, there, was, there was nothing with regards to um, a wrong done in, in, in that regard with respect to uh, service. Now, that then comes the big question of 
whether the high court or the Supreme Court had the mandate to, to hear, hear this. The case. And I mean, it was an interesting uh, 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 verdict as delivered. Let's just read. The Supreme Court carries the constitutional obligation to give the correct interpretation of Article 971G for its enforcement, if need be, by the High Court or any person that the interpretation comes to. In fact, we, we could not capture fully exactly what, what, what the Chief she Justice said. had to say. But essentially, the argument she made was that even if the process went to the High Court first, it would have ended up at the Supreme Court anyways. Right. It was one of, the, one of the justifications she offered in arriving as the fact that the Supreme Court had the jurisdiction mm. to, to interpret the Constitution. And she makes uh, the point as well with, uh, with Article 2, reference to Article 2, that the Supreme Court has jurisdiction over all matters, can step in when necessary. Mm. And so that as well mm. uh, wipes clean the argument as to whether or not this uh, stay of execution, which Apenyo Markin saw that the Supreme Court should have gone to the High Court first. And then perhaps uh, lastly will be impact uh, on the constituents, which was an argument that's been made and we've been seeing the reactions which, been, which has come forth. Mm. Uh, she made the argument that the four constituencies are made up of hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians who are queued to elect these members of parliament to represent their interests in parliament as their voices. Hence, asking that their seats be declared vacant will mean they will have no representation in some 30 plus days mm. until uh, January 7, 2025 which would have denied them representation. And then it would have caused irreparable harm to the members of parliament as well. Their salaries, allowances, and possible entitlement. And then alluded to the fact that if they were ministers of state, it would also mean that they could not render services to the yeah. state as well. Yeah. Hence the decision and to then, have and granted. Even, even before you go on, so she then references particularly the second one of the deputy affected speaker of persons parliament. out of this for which is the second deputy speaker of parliament saying that declaring his seat vacant meaning that for between now and when parliament is dissolved in january uh, early january next year the role he is supposed to play as second deputy speaker will be up in in smoke because it no. means it's a crucial role someone must be there <laughs> he's playing service not just to parliament but he's but, playing a role for the republic and their representatives Asking them not to come to parliament has attendant e effects across board. So Absolutely. they are saying that more or less buttressing the kind of damage the speaker's orders will have on running government business and parliament. And, and, well. and that will always come back to a subject of debate. I, I say this because when the, when the speaker had, uh, had vacated these seats, the NDC caucus was moving to have the second deputy speaker position immediately mm. uh, filled up for them as well. And so yeah. that could be so a subject it, area absolutely. that could come up for, for debate as to whether or not that position could not be immediately filled and yeah. whether or not the justification will fit 100%. But outside, outside of that, let's look a bit more in terms of the timing of parliamentary representation. And that's... that's what, what one of the things we're alluding to that these Ghanaians would have been left without a voice and representation in parliament from the 18th <laughs> to January 7, 2025, when the ninth parliament would have been duly, would have been duly uh, constituted in Ghana, which was one of the many things, the lack of representation. And yeah. we mentioned that already there's been feedback or reaction to this particular aspect of representation between the 18th and then January 7, people readily bring in Sal mm. and, 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 mm. and the fact that they've not had representation mm. in, 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 the, in the Eighth Parliament at all, Martin. And it's interesting that also the Supreme Court are minded to raise these specific issues where you are conscious of the fact that asking these four to leave Parliament mm. is not just the four that have been affected, but their constituents. And she actually even went to use words like hundreds of thousands Absolutely. of people who killed uh, they are going to miss out on parliamentary uh, act, uh, activities if you ask these four MPs to go. But this same Supreme Court, for the last four, almost four years, were aware of the fact that Sal, or people within the uh, Santro Kofi, now, now it's the Guan do constituency, have, do not have not been represented for four years. Mm. That they didn't mention at all. So people, at least, they could have even 
touch that in their uh, you know submission mm. and say that we are aware that this is the current impact it will have however there is also sal but they make no mention of sal that is why some lawyers think that they are picking and choosing well, respectfully well, the argument the, the argument could them. be made that what was before them is what they are dealing with was, is what is what they are dealing with and not necessarily uh, the guan constituency sal which is now the guan constituency then again another argument can be made that when the initial petition raised in relation to Sal uh, came up. Mm. He ended up at the Supreme Court, uh -huh. and then the Supreme Court directed them to go to the High Court, which was the appropriate uh, <laughs> a, a, a court to deal with the matter. And so they will always come back to uh, an issue of perspective the, and the debate in relation to how, how it all goes. the Supreme Court was minded to say that the constituency of Sal, that particular issue, it is the high court that must deal with it. Then, then the it brings survey, back to, it goes back to, to the issue of to, uh, why are you picking and choosing uh, a subject why? of yeah. su subject of, of of jurisdiction amongst many things. And so these are the are the key key items the highlights of hi what highlights from from the ruling yesterday, which which have become topical and particularly on this last part. It's, it's stoking debate strongly yeah. across social media and across different uh, legal minds, and even the ordinary Ghanaian as well, seeking to express a few uh, thoughts in relation to maybe, that. Maybe before we move on, we want to come and in, 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 in a jiffy, our producers are trying to get us to see which other key items Parliament is expected to debate on before they rise or before Parliament is dissolved in early January 2025. But the Supreme Court made reference and stuck to that particular reference, which is Article 2, 2, Article 2, 2, 2, 3, and 2, 4, which actually gives entire power of interpretation of the Constitution to the Supreme Court. Mm. So everything they have dismissed, either from the lawyers of uh, um, the Speaker, speaker. Tadio Sorry, is buttressed by Article 2, 2, 2, 3, and 2, 4, which says that it is only the Supreme Court that have the power to interpret what's in the Constitution. So you might read it as plain English, but they say that they are the only people clothed with the thinking capacity to explain what the Constitution says. And then also it raises the question of when one of the cases they were asking was, why are you the one saying that a, the Supreme Court how, I mean, the High Court also has some level of jurisdiction. Mm. They dismiss the High Court angle because they say that if it has to do with interpretation, the High Court does not have that capacity. J jurisdiction. Or, and they would have eventually got back, back to they, the Supreme Court Absolutely. Uh, judges to look into. That, that's why it didn't have to start there at all. Uh, so they, essentially, the, the <laughs> argument uh, uh, that, 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 is, right. that is being made. But I think we can, we can now look at what happens next from here, yeah. Uh, so we know, in, for in, instance, in, in, that in relation to businesses expected yeah. on on the floor of the house, and I mean that's on the screen right now. Uh, so we're seeing the the two Supreme Court justice nominees as well. That is up for approval, and it essentially could have meant that um, that will be on hold. And yes. if the if the NDC where the majority with the with the vacancies declared and the yeah, opinion has been that the supreme court was excessively being packed we could see a possible rejection of, of these, these of these two nominees as well and there's a that's quite so, a so back these story. are these are the uh, outstanding business businesses that needs to be done before parliament rises and so like you indicated there are two uh, judges who are expected, I mean, they have been vetted. Nominees. Nominees. They've vetted. been vetted, but they have not been approved Absolutely. by the uh, vetting committee of parliament because they raised some reservations about them and the president is yet to react. So that is on hold. And then also, you're talking about tax waivers. Yes. Uh, tax waivers in excess of 350 million for five companies under the One District, One Factory. There's the International Development Association ID of the World Bank loan facility as well. Uh, then there are a plethora of bills which are expected. And you'd recall when we return to the House after uh, the 18th of October, October ruling and the subsequent uh, court proceedings and the stay, on that day, that Tuesday, which a lot of Ghanaians expected the showdown, the free SHS bill, 
was amongst the many things which was expected to be tabled before the House. Mm. That is one thing that's been mooted by the government, and they've said that they want to pass a bill which will protect the free SHS policy. That forms a part of the many bills which are expected to go before uh, this eighth parliament, even as it dies away slowly mm. and, be, and be considered at least to a certain level. And if passed under a certificate of urgency, we could have seen that uh, come, to, come to fruition. And so yeah. the architect's registration bill as well, one of the many such bills, the Economic and Organized Crime Office Amendment Bill, the Vaccines Development and Manufacturing Bill 2024, Environmental Protection Agency Bill as well. Mm. Um, and talking that, about the Environmental Protection Agency Bill, I mean, what comes to mind has to do with the decision of the president as part Absolutely. of the efforts to fight Galamse has asked for the repeal of one specific law. Um, an Allowing LI mining and forest reserves, LI 2462. 62. That is also expected uh, in parliament to be able to help in the Galamse fight as well. Then uh, we know that this was initially on, on the cards, merger of the electricity company of Ghana and Northern and uh, Electricity Distribution, and then the VRA Netco uh, merger as mm. well. We know that the energy ministry has asked that that be put on hold. And so that was uh, one of the many things that was expected to be in parliament. Then there's the Business Regulatory Reform Commission bill, the Office of the Administrator of School Lands, mm. the University of Local Governance and Development Bill, Interpretation Amendment Bill 2024, amongst many things. Uh, these were the urgent business that uh, were expected to be on the floor of the House. And then, most importantly, which has not been captured here, is the mini budget for 2025, which uh -huh. would have taken care of the first quarter of 2025, 2025. because come what may, uh, there will be uh, a, a new government, whether mm. or not an MPP government or an NDC government, that remains a question for the Ghanaian voter mm. come December 7. But per contingency and the fact that spending has to go on, there's a need for that, mm. that budget to be, to be put before parliament and approved for salaries and other things to be mm. able to proceed at least in the first quarter of 2025.